Terrific. So I'd like to invite the uh, panelists for the next conversation. Uh, Phil, Dave, uh, and Susan, please. Terrific. Well, we're going to start with uh, just maybe go around and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey here, and uh, uh, what you're most passionate about. And we'll start with you, because you're... <laughs> Thanks, I'm Susan Irons. My journey started, well, let's see, I studied philosophy, so naturally <laughs> come and uh, find a manufacturing business to invest in in New Zealand. <laughs> and uh, yeah, invested in fake industries um, in about yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. And it uh, started throwing off dividends, and so I had yeah. some um, excess capital to reinvest. So um, I went and got into the angel investing uh, yeah. thing. Through that, met other angel investors, and um, we've got a club going, which is all very nice, and uh, it's a really great little ecosystem now. So it's lots of fun. Cool. Um, so I guess to distill it, it's what I said yesterday. I um, am passionate about creating jobs locally to improve lives globally. Mm. So I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Whatever um, businesses we do, it should actually have possibility the possibility of um, improving lives throughout the world not just here how much time we got you want me to start at one two so, <laughs> um, so I guess I've, I, I start off my life as a, as a pretty frustrated entrepreneur and um, um, and so when I worked for Deloitte Consulting for 10 years in, in New Zealand and, and internationally in the States, um, came back and founded my own uh, consulting business with a couple of mates um, when it was time to kind of break the shackles of, of living the corporate life and actually make the decision to, to prove to myself whether I could do it or not. So um, that was one of the big, you know, big drivers initially for me. Um, we were fortunate when we, we, we created our um, consulting business. We, we actually, this in the late 90s, um, had a focus from day one on reinvesting that back into um, into the company and to the individuals that were around us. We wanted to create um, innovation within our, it was a software consulting business, so um, it was uh, around the time of the dot-com boom around and the internet was just coming to New Zealand. So um, through a bunch of connections and friends, we, we managed to invest in TradeMe right at the start. Um, TradeMe became New Zealand's eBay um, and was, I guess, the, the first real shining light of, of what you can do with tech investment in New Zealand. So um, uh, that exited in 2005 to Fairfax. Um, it was a real, you know, I, I, to me it would be the first sign of actually the tall poppy syndrome getting um, um, shot down uh, in New Zealand because he was a bunch of guys and an individual Sam who'd had this incredible success and, and he was well supported in that, um, I think. So that, that gave us the opportunity to just step back from what we're doing and just start looking at, at what we wanted to do and um, basically for us that became to continue to invest back in entrepreneurship and, and the development of, I guess, the tech entrepreneurial scene in New Zealand. And that's what we've been doing since 2005. I'm, a, I'm an active angel investor. I'm managing partner of a venture fund in, in Wellington um, called Movac. Um, and I do this um, five days a week, um, or seven days a week, really. And so why we do this, ultimately, we, we, we did this to support entrepreneurship in New Zealand. And if there's a loftier goal, it is actually about raising the economic output of New Zealand. And um, through that, and you know, this is how we look at how we have an impact, if we can raise the income of New Zealanders, if we can raise um, the well-being of New Zealanders, this stuff will trickle down and um, flows back into the system. And that's how we're looking to create change. Yep. Thanks. I'm Dave Moskowitz. Um, I grew up in the US. I moved out here in 1982 uh, on my OE, although I didn't know that what it, that's what it was at the time because Americans don't have OE. But um, I, uh, after a career in the IT industry, I got sort of bored of it in the 1990s, enrolled in doing a PhD in applied linguistics, uh, studying the phonology of New Zealand Sign Language uh, in 1990, and uh, eventually discovered the internet in the same way that Columbus discovered North America. I suppose there are already people living there. Uh, and, and in 1994, my wife and I started uh, one of Wellington's uh, first web development companies, which we grew into uh, 40 people in, uh, in Auckland and Wellington and uh, exited out uh, to, uh, to a multinational uh, in 2002. Since then, I've um, been using the proceeds from that trade sale uh, uh, mainly for uh, angel investment as well as some philanthropy. 
sometimes, as Phil's fond of saying, it's hard to tell the difference between the two. But um, I'm a firm believer. I'm a firm believer in building the world you want to live in. And so I see investment in uh, tech companies in Wellington as part of building the Wellington that I want to live in and the New Zealand that I want to live in. So I would love to see a, well, a Wellington, which is already a fantastic city, but you know it can go so much further. I'd love to see a Wellington where there was just, you know, that where, where the tech industry was the industry, where there was a constant flow of people and businesses and information and ideas uh, with the rest of the world. We've already got that. We just need to pour petrol on it. And investment is, is that petrol that, uh, that we're trying to pour on it. So I've been involved with Lightning Lab, uh, New Zealand's first accelerator program, a startup weekend, uh, helping people recognize uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, we've processed well over uh, 2,000 people now in New Zealand through startup weekends, and it's just been uh, amazing. So uh, I'm passionate about uh, bringing the best out in people and helping them realize that they have capabilities uh, that they never even knew that they had and taking those capabilities and putting them to productive use by connecting them with other people and other resources. So just before we get going with the main part, um, kind of hands up, who here is a New Zealand resident? Please put your hand up. Right, so who here is not a New Zealand resident? Okay, so that's probably around, what, maybe 20%. So I just thought that that, should, that could inform the conversation that we have in, in some ways. Over to you, guys. Uh, you can hold on to that. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the amazing things of being on this panel with you is the three of you could have been in anywhere in the world at this point, and you decided to be in New Zealand uh, and do what you do here. So I'm curious to hear what your perspectives are on the both opportunities and challenges of investing in technology and startups here uh, in the New Zealand ecosystem. So the, there are many facets to that question. I mean, if you're asking why, why am I here in New Zealand, it's because it's such a fantastic place to live. Um, New Zealanders, uh, I think, are second to none in the world as a community of people that are good. New Zealanders are fundamentally good deep down in a way that I haven't seen anywhere else in the rest of the world. And, um, and that's a really good reason for being here. So, but in terms of the, you know, the, the, the opportunities and challenges that we have doing this in New Zealand. Um, New Zealand is at the edge and is isolated in many ways, and that is both a great strength and a great weakness. It's a great strength uh, because in many ways we're not polluted with some of the uh, sort of faddish ideas that happen elsewhere in the world, and we can develop our own fads and, 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 and develop our own ways of doing things. It's a weakness because often we're out of step with the rest of the world and when we do something new and people don't understand it, they don't see any obvious way that it can plug in. And uh, I'll, let, uh, I'll let you guys go to some of the other ones. You can probably tell by my accent, it's pretty easy why I'm here. Um, this is home, you know, home's where the heart is and I wouldn't go anywhere else. Um, I've, I've traveled a lot around the world um, um, over, the, over the years, traveled with my family. Um, I, I, I take various opportunities when I can to spend time overseas, I love to travel. Um, but I love coming home, and you know I wouldn't bring up my kids anywhere else. Um, so, so you know it's home, and um, so that, so that's that's kind of me, I guess, as to why I'm here. It's pretty easy. Um, on the uh, on the investment side, you know the the, um, the opportunities and the challenge. Um, I, there's a ton of opportunities from a, from a tech investment perspective in New Zealand, um, and it's a sector and an, uh, an ecosystem that's just gone from strength to strength since the kind of late 90s when we we really started looking around, and it's just fundamentally different in terms of the deal flow that we see with. Um, with a lot of stuff that's kind of um, come on board in the last 10 years, but it is young, and that's probably the challenge. Um, so we're only, we're only 10 years in, and, and we keep looking to Silicon Valley as an example. Silicon Valley's at least 30 years in, probably probably 50. Am I, I'm kind of looking at the Americans in the audience. So um, uh, we're, we're, still, we're still maturing, and we, we had the question before, I think, from Dan about um, serial entrepreneurs. So, so our biggest challenge as investors is that we're, we're working alongside, when we invest, um, very inexperienced in individuals, ultimately. You know, they have fantastic ideas, they've got tremendous courage in terms of what they're trying to achieve. But by and large, generally, they're inexperienced. 
and not only are they inexperienced, and in my experience in the US, there's a very um, high bar put on education, and a, and a lot of people go on to, to secondary university sort of degrees. They, they do their MBA, um, or they do some form of other higher study, and we typically don't, or haven't typically done that in New Zealand. So when I'm dealing with an entrepreneur, um, oh, look, 100% of them don't have a business degree. So, so some of the basics that go into, but some of the basic structures that, that you might be experienced of, of seeing often aren't there. So, you know, how do I put a business plan together? How do I put a budget together? How do I raise money? How do I present? There's a, there's a lot of support required about that. And then when you start to think about, okay, I've made the investment, how am I going to help this guy, guy or girl scale their business from uh, no sales to $10 million in sales? Um, and there's nobody around the table with experience. So, so, so the, the thing that we, we've started to focus on as investors, and, and it's so great to see something like Kiwi Connect here, is how we create that connectivity to, to experience. Um, because we have to surround these companies with experience. And I, and I can tell you this as a Kiwi who's grown up here for 45 years, 46 I think, um, we don't listen. Okay, our, our internal arrogance is that we know right. You know, there's a bit of she'll be right, you'll hear that in New Zealand, it's not really she'll be right, it's I know right, okay? Get out of my way because I know right and I don't need to listen. Innately, New Zealanders, in my experience, do not play well together. Um, and there's been a lot of work with government agencies trying to hook up industries. But at the end of the day, when you try to do that, you've got competitive instincts that are at play and they all think they're world beaters, so they don't play naturally nicely together. Uh, and where we actually need people with accents on our board tables is they're much better at listening to them than they are to us. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, no, so there's nothing better than bringing an American accent into a board table or as a mentor, um, particularly in the fields of sales and marketing, which is the areas that we struggle the most in, scaling that up. Um, that, that, that I'd say is the biggest challenge here. So, so these sorts of networks, these sorts of bridges are, are, are really, really important. Yeah. All right, I guess this is where I admit to the American accent and not having <laughs> been born here, I suppose I did skate over that a little bit. <laughs> and I'll, I'll risk going on with some more stereotypes because in terms of, of challenges, you know, a real difference between uh, growing up in the U.S. And, and what you see kids grow up here and, and the effect of it is that, you know, there it's more entrepreneurial to begin with. You know, they'll have lemonade stands. They're more likely to go door-to-door -door selling as part of what they have to do with their service clubs and that sort of thing. And I just don't see that much um, sort of the capitalist underpinning of the culture here. So that's more of a challenge in attitude. And the inexperience that Phil was talking about, which is not just educational, is, is cultural as well, because um, people won't have um, you know, just gone and tried to make some crafts and sell them door to door, usually here, as uh, in the US, for example. Though, that being said, there's always the exception. I did have neighbor kids come to my door and offer to sell me their dough gardens. It was really cute. Of course, I bought a pet rock or something from them. <laughs> so um, why I'm here and what I really love about it is, is the natural beauty, um, the character of the people, the sense that we can do anything. You know, you've got that here. I grew up in Southern California, but it's in New Zealand that I had um, people on my street who won Academy Awards. You know, you just, we've got uh, someone in Porirua who won the U.S. Golf Open. It's just mind-blowing that we achieve so much with what we've got. There's the sense that anything is possible. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, more than outweighs the challenges. Hmm. That's, that's interesting to hear because one of the conversations that keeps on coming up is around confidence of entrepreneurs. And Phil, I know you brought up the tall poppy syndrome. And, and Susan, you mentioned that there's so many Kiwi achievers uh, from not just the entrepreneurial community, but just from the wider community as well. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts around uh, what the level of confidence is for entrepreneurs that you're engaging with here to create big, hairy, audacious goals and, and, and big targets that are just beyond even the New Zealand market and try to solve big problems. 
I don't have any, um, you know, definitive idea there because I've seen both. I've seen people with big, hairy, audacious goals and ones with um, the idea of a business that could scale and really go a long way, but without the, the sort of vision to really believe in themselves about it. So I don't know what other people's experience are. Is. Um, yeah, a couple, couple of points. I, I, I think the tall poppy syndrome is a myth. Um, it's something that hasn't really come up for us in five or six, seven, eight years. Um, so I'll actually sort of counter some of what Shane and the other guys said, said earlier. Um, and, and I also think the batch, ba beam, batch beamer is a myth. And frankly, um, folks that go and do that, I think that's tremendous. Because I think, you know, we're on this planet to live our lives. Um, and, and if you can go and do that, we shouldn't be ashamed of that. Um, but everyone that I know who's made money is putting money back. Um, you know, when you've, when, you've come, when you've grown up with that sort of intensity of doing your job day in, day out, you don't stop. So, so everyone that I know is back in the community in some shape or form. They're either mentoring or they're actively investing. Um, and, I, and, I, and that tall poppy thing did used to be around about, about a decade ago, but I, I see very, very few signs of it anymore, and I, I see us celebrating success more and more. But, but Kiwis by nature are not driven by monetary success. I don't, I don't think it's, um, particularly in the way that I see it in the US, it's, it's just not... It's just not the same um, in, in terms of that driver. So I think the difference is when you t translate that to business and, and the BHAG sort of um, conversation is what I would say is that for, particularly for most first-time entrepreneurs in New Zealand who might have come out of the Lightning Lab or, or the startup community, um, and for some of them they're still, still in their early 20s, they might not have even done their OE. Um, they haven't yet opened their eyes to the world. We're, we're a long way away from the world, so they don't see the scale of the opportunity. So, so they're thinking smaller than where they could be. And, and that's, that's holding them back in terms of how they tell their investment story, um, how they communicate with their market in terms of their ambition. Um, and it was one of the reasons we were quite keen to work with John on the Kiwi landing pad um, to create a base in San Francisco where, if nothing else, we could send send these guys up to the valley, spend two weeks there and just get an injection of speed and size and scale and then it, it fundamentally reshapes them actually when you see them come back because they come back with a different level of intensity and expectation and then about three months later they're back down to the Kiwi speed and the Kiwi way of doing things so you put them back on the plane and you send them back up and give them that injection again. So, you know, there, there definitely is, um, we're growing up in a market here that has far less scale than what you see around the rest of the world. So. Um, we have to open open eyes, and you, and you only really do that by travelling and, and experiencing things in market. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I mean, when uh, when entrepreneurs approach me for investment, the first thing I say, well, what's your plan to get overseas? What's your distribution strategy for the rest of the world? And many of them say, oh, well, yeah, I thought we'd, uh, you know, first we'll do Wellington. And uh, then if that works in Wellington, then we might go to Auckland. And then if we, you know, once we get Auckland, you know, we might go to Sydney. And, you know, and that'll be good. It's like, okay, so, you know, Australia is just a big New Zealand, really. You know, it's very similar in so many ways. It's, it's only 20, 20 million people there. So for the same amount of effort, you could go to San Francisco or to London and achieve much greater things in much bigger markets. So that's part of the whole eye-opening process um, of getting people to be investment ready because it is that scale that they need exposure to, and they, and, and they must realize that what they're doing actually has applicability on the world stage, and if it doesn't, then it's probably not worth doing. Um, the tall poppy syndrome I have seen, I see it more in the general population than in people who self-select uh, as entrepreneurs, so, um, so that's you know, not so big a problem for us. But I think part of the, one of the things connected to the tall poppy syndrome is our connectedness as a community in New Zealand. Everyone knows everyone. There's you know a degree and a half of separation, and I think it's that closeness which makes people maybe a little bit more reticent to you know to 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 to, to pop out from the crowd. And this closeness in New Zealand makes it such an easy place to get stuff done and do business whenever you want to. You you know if I wanted to ring up the CEO of I don't know any company, I could find out someone who knows them and ring them up and within 15 minutes I'll be on the phone with them. And most Kiwis are surprised that the rest of the world doesn't work this way. So that, you know, when in New Zealand you think, oh, oh, 
we need uh, you know we need a CFO. Oh well, yeah, my my cousin Mary, you know, she she did some bookkeeping for a while, and she's out of a job at the moment, and you know we could bring her in, and you know we could turn her into a CFO. You know, the rest of the world doesn't look like that. Um, when you want to set up a business internationally, you need to look for the best resources, and your connectedness to other people is no longer relevant. So that's one of the challenges that we have is pulling people out of that particular comfort zone. Dave, I gotta say, I really like your Kiwi accent there. <laughs> um, I, it's funny, I've been here for two years now and I've heard the term Silicon Valley more here than when I lived in San Francisco. Um, I'm curious to hear how much of the entrepreneurial ecosystem here is trying to emulate Silicon Valley and, and how much of the energy is going towards um, being the best version of who we are. So th I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because it was something I was going to bring up anyway if you didn't. And that is, you know, many people say, well, what do we need to do to become the next Silicon Valley? And to them I say, I don't want to be the next Silicon Valley. I left, I left that whole place in 1982 to come here. I want to be the next Wellington. I want to be what we can be collectively. You know, what is it about us that's different? That connectedness, the goodness. You know, that's all stuff that's, that's different about us that we can really capitalize on and turn into something that's even more awesome. So in terms of emulating Silicon Valley, I think that it's necessary to be plug compatible, if you will, with Silicon Valley because you know, in, order to, in order to get investment capital to grow into the US, typically you're gonna have to go to Silicon Valley in, 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 order, to, uh, in order to find that investment or to somewhere offshore. Um, if Phil says no. Um, but <laughs> so you know, we, we need we need to we need to have you know similar similar sorts of structures in place. But in terms of uh, you know a lot of the uh, sort of very narrow sort of investment theses that they have in Silicon Valley um, and uh, and other structures, I think we can do so much better here, and we can. But the issue that we have is that we're very resource poor compared to Silicon Valley. There's so much money sloshing around there. Uh, that it makes you know the money that we have here available for our startups look really paltry, and uh, I can't remember who who it was who described New Zealand startups as a bit like Gallipoli, you know we under resource them, we underfund them, we send them into the trench, and all of a sudden we say, okay, you're gonna go overseas now. We blow the whistle, tweet over the top, boys, over the top, boom, 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 boom. and down they go. So um, you know. And we try to do that. We try to, you know, fund startups for a couple of hundred thousand dollars and get them offshore. Well, you know what? Most of the time, it doesn't work at all. And so that's something that we really need to get beyond. And I think that's a matter of time before we can solve that problem in terms of recycling capital from successfully exited entrepreneurs and bringing money in from offshore. But I don't want to see us turn into the next Silicon Valley for the sake of that. I don't, I don't really have anything to add. Um, I, I, the, well, the, the only comment I'd make is I'd say it's, it's probably a bit mythical, like I said before. There's, um, we have a perception of what it is, but for, for those of us that have grown up here, um, we don't really know what that is. Um, I travel there two or three times a year, but it really doesn't give me any great insight into the culture of the place, and I, I hear different things from different people. Um, I can tell you that the success rates of New Zealand companies raising money in Silicon Valley... Um, um, there's one or two out of hundreds, and I, uh, you know, as a as an investor, I get a little frustrated that New Zealanders will will quickly move to go to try to go to this this mythical, mythical thing called Silicon Valley. I'm still trying to find the sign. Welcome to Silicon Valley. Um, 101 is great, by the way. I love it. You know, um, and I particularly like all those two-story beige buildings, those office blocks that you've got. <laughs> Anyone here who's an aspiring entrepreneur that wants to go to Silicon Valley, there's much better places in the US that you could go and set up shop. Um, go to Denver or somewhere like that, it'd be way cooler. But um, Yeah, so I, I don't really think, we, what we know is that it's an economic powerhouse and there's elements in there that we have to learn from in terms of um, the way they work as, way people work as investors over there, how companies get created in much shorter cycles than they get created here. And, and, and what are the best parts we can take about that and develop our own culture down here or, or invite those who have been successful over there down there to work with us, um, with the companies that we're trying to help up there. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't really have anything to add to um, Dave's um, excellent comments and uh, Phil's other insights as well. <laughs> but um, with the Silicon Valley, I think Phil's comment of it being a, a myth is pretty close to what I'd say. It's just a concept or an ideal. You know, they've done something really well and we'd like to do the same kind of thing. And that's why we keep referring to it because that's the kind of thing we want to do well ourselves. And they're, they're world class. That's just... They're the world leaders at it. They're the best in the world. Mm. All the same. Doesn't mean we want to be them. Mm. So can I add something to that? Just want to go back to what Scott Nolan was saying yesterday about how to, how to fundraise in Silicon Valley. The number one way to fundraise is to be connected and already know somebody who's made money for a VC, right? So again, there's this network in Silicon Valley that we don't have very good access to here in New Zealand. And so that's one of the... Uh, important functions of Kiwi Connect is actually helping extend the New Zealand network out offshore and extend the US network uh, offshore to New Zealand and, and hopefully meet in the middle so we can develop much stronger networks so that the flow of talent and capital uh, happens a lot more freely when everybody knows each other. You kind of answered my last question which was how can we help? Um, is there beyond just that networking and helping connect, are there other ways that us as Kiwi Connect, but also as the foreign community that's gathered here today, can help in, in supporting the ecosystem thrive here. You know, you, you, it's wonderful that you've brought us together here, and I really appreciate the opportunity to meet you know so many people in um, diverse areas. It's in its own right very helpful. There's uh, carrying on what we've we've done here, the connections that have been made. There's uh, perhaps some sort of database resource that might be made that would, um, you know, allow us to know in more depth what, uh, depth what other people have to offer. Because we do have any number of, of needs, particularly working with small early stage companies. You know, we need everything and particularly connections. We need expertise. We need lots of help like that. It's not just a shortage of capital that our small companies have. They need everything to begin with. They're just, they're not viable to begin with and you really have to put a lot into them to get them further. So it's a very complex question. I'm hoping that somebody else has put more thought into this than me. Oh, thanks. No, Dave's already answered it, I think. Um, just get hands on with a, with a couple of Kiwi companies, you know. it's. Um, in some ways, connections or introductions are, are kind of cheap, and, and, and I say that, you know, you've got to be careful about your relationship capital when you introduce someone, um, so, that, so they're not cheap, but the, the stuff that's really valuable is when you're prepared to sit alongside a company for, for um, you know, a day a month, um, and, and that might entail making the right connection. I, I, can, I can tell you now that most New Zealand companies do not know how to design a sales force. Okay? So our number one issue is how do you take what we call the arts and crafts department in New Zealand, which is a, a, marketing, a marketing team and a, sales, a bunch of salespeople. They're really good at just walking in the door and telling a story and systematizing that in a way that will scale. And most New Zealanders in the marketing and sales world resist that. Now what I do have to say about our New Zealand marketing, our arts and crafts department, is we do wonderful art. You know, so I, some of the marketing concepts I think we come up with are really, really good, but then we fall down on execution. So the, the people that we look to bring into a company that we're, we're parachuting into the valley or into the US or another part of the world is where's that person going to come from that's going to lead the sales team through the next round in this company? And, and if, if, if you folks can kind of make those introductions or those, those connections which become the first VP of sales hire who turns um, you know, the, the sales idea into a sales process, that's something we really lack um, depth of experience with the New Zealand. Getting better, but still, it's still green fields for us here. So just um, harmonizing with these guys. Um, I think that uh, you know, forming even deeper connections so that what we've experienced uh, here in this milieu uh, can extend on. And now whether those connections are electronic uh, or whether they're face-to-face, -face, uh, ideally I'd like to see them very personal. So I'd like everyone here 
to, if you're a New Zealander, reach out to someone else. If you're someone else, reach out to a New Zealander. Make a friend. Keep that connection going. Come and visit each other frequently. You know, we, we love visitors here, and I know you love visitors over there. And so let's visit each other regularly and share our, share our stories and our problems and our triumphs and just get to know each other better because there's so much good uh, available to come from that. So let's keep the relationship going after today. That's a lovely thought, Dave. Just uh, a way to perhaps make that happen would be if we could have a list circulating email addresses of everybody here so we you know, know the names and addresses and just one list going around to everybody just for ourselves. Mm. I like that idea. And that's one of the ideas that we're working on as well is to first get everybody in the same space and then follow up with email introductions. So I'm, I'm glad you all brought that up. Um, I'd love to open it up to the audience. I know there are many more investors and, and members of the community who would either have uh, comments to contribute, but also any questions for our panelists, but others also in the audience to discuss. So I'll give my mic to Rebecca. She's even waving her hand. <laughs> so um, I actually, this elephant's been in the room for several days and I keep forgetting to point it out. <laughs> Thanks for signing up for the, um, <laughs> One of the critical issues for, for the venture capital community, it doesn't matter where they are, if they make a substantive investment in a company, that generally means they have to travel to that company's headquarters. They just, you know, in the diligence, that's one piece to look at how the organizations come together, how it, well it works. But then you have board meetings. And, and granted, you can, from here, that time zone difference isn't that bad. But that is an issue. And so it makes me wonder how realistic it is to look to Silicon Valley. Now, when Silicon Valley is really interested, they put an office there. Barcelona turned out to have something like 15 technical universities. and. You know, in three months, all the major VCs put offices there. So I think I'm, my curiosity is, I think it's something you need to keep doing, but it, I, there's a question of realism for me about trying to get money there if it's not willing to come here. Anybody want to respond? Um, I entirely agree. You know, I, I think for a lot of Kiwi companies that um, expect to go and spend a month up in the valley and raise funds, they're, and, and they haven't done it with the right introduction, they're, they're, they're wasting their time. And... Um, uh, the, the the best thing they can do. I mean, we talk to a bunch of VCs because we're looking for partners to come into our to the companies that we've invested in. Um, and it, it's interesting, you know. I got a, I got a really blank. I got a really straight bit of feedback from one the other day, which was 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 fantastic. Is um, um, just come up here with momentum. If you've got momentum, you'll get funding. You know? And we, we were like, well, what about team? You know, team's really really important to what we're investing. Don't care about team. We're we're a big we're a big VC. We'll fix team. We'll get rid of all those guys. We'll just bring in another one. Just, just come up with momentum. And you know, most of our Kiwi companies, when they're going up there, they've got their first fifty thousand dollars in sales, and they go, you know, that was that was ten thousand dollars one month, five thousand dollars the other, fifteen thousand dollars the other, and and that's not momentum. And yet we're investing a lot of effort to go up there and and, and try to do this. So I, th I do think it's a bit misguided. I, I tend to agree. Um, but there are other parts of the US who, who 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 which actually look more like New Zealand um, in terms of their local economies, which which may be more open to it. Um, the one comment I would make about board meetings and um, being remote, uh, uh, and I can't comment on the US, but as New Zealand investors, we're really used to it. So um, I've got a couple of board meetings in the Valley coming up um, mid-March. I'll be flying up there for those board meetings. The other board meetings are done on Skype. Um, I had to go through the Valley up to Philadelphia, across to Chicago with one of my other companies last year. Um, board meetings over there, board meetings back here. I had a board meeting on the speakerphone on the car on the way out here this morning, which was for a New Zealand company. Um, we've been doing business this way for the last um, five, six, seven years because you know we've probably got the biggest adoption rate with Skype. I always used to say to Americans, can I have your Skype address? And they're like, what's Skype? Um, and there's still a bit of that. Um, when I talk to a US VC, they don't want to talk to me on a Skype. They want to phone me on my cell phone. I'm like, well, but we'd do it for free on Skype and the call's better. <laughs> so I think we're really used to it, but certainly coming back the other way, it's um, not, you know, people aren't as used to it. Yeah. So uh, how many people here know David Tenhave? Yeah? 
Whoop, there we go. In his words, you need to be there to be there. So there's no point in raising money in a place if you're not actually already there, as Phil points out, with momentum. Yeah. Um, if possible, I'd like to ask Vaughn if, if you could share some of your insights um, on distance and how that has impacted Vanden and the work that you do. Because um, we haven't had many Kiwi companies raised from abroad and yeah, keen to hear your thoughts. Vaughn. Sure. <laughs> uh, distance. So um, one of the greatest opportunities we got is that the internet provides us this great connected to the rest of the world. And I think it's a little bit of a trick for a lot of Kiwi companies that they think, cool, uh, we're super connected, so I don't need to get on a plane. Uh, when all the internet really provides is a, a neat way for you to send emails and, you know, and documents uh, and Skype. Um, but really the biggest impact uh, you can make is actually getting on a plane and, and meeting somebody face to face because as humans those are the connections that we cherish you know just some random person on the other end of an email even though they may have something interesting to say it's really the relationships you build over lunch or over a beer um, uh, and the relationships that take time you know uh, uh, there's this other myth which is you know uh, so you get on the plane you go to the valley and then you meet a VC and you've got a term sheet on the back of a napkin I mean, that never happens. And if you get offered one of those, then uh, you're doing it wrong. You probably shouldn't accept the terms. Uh, every investor that we've brought on board has been a, a, a six to nine month conversation. Um, also, it's not just about New Zealand and the Valley. You know, we've raised the majority of our money from Berlin and, and Melbourne and, and around New Zealand, uh, with only a very small part of it coming out of, out of the US. Um, so, you know, really it's, it's, what I tell people is it's about just having that opportunity to tell a story and take time to tell that story and make it a really fucking good story. But, um, you know, that's the most impactful thing you can do is, is, you know, tell everybody your story. Just invest all of your time and energy in that. All of our investors that we've brought on board, you know, the very first time I met every single investor, I, I didn't, I had no preconception that they would become an investor. They were just somebody I met and I told them the story. And then at some point down the track, they, they confessed that they fell in love with the story and wanted to become an investor. And I think those are the best investors that you can find. And I've actually got a, a technical question relating to that to kind of everybody actually, anyone who's got a response to it is, uh, for starting entrepreneurs, if, especially if they have to travel back and forth, the flight price, and having to do that, I mean, it's not, it's not cheap to travel to the US. Um, has anybody here tried to do anything about that? Any, any solutions? Uh, any ideas with Air New Zealand or others? I was suggesting you Peter Crisp that the best thing you could do is wind up NZTE and put the budget into Air New Zealand to subsidise flights. Sorry, Shane. You're, you're very impactful. <laughs> Every company that money, right. Shane. Just be yeah. go easy. <laughs> yeah. So what happened to that? No, it was shut down in years, so because there was no the the um, from the metrics perspective, everybody was like, well, where's the wins? And we're like, well, it's going to take more than two years yeah. to show a win for those companies going backwards and forwards, up and down in the market. But again, it comes back to what Matt was saying before that as government, um, if we take risk, there's about a thousand people lining up who are willing to throw rocks at us. Um, I think the environment in New Zealand has changed a lot now where um, actually the tech scene, particularly in the entrepreneur scene in New Zealand, is actually much more willing and is pushing government to take risk, which is good to see, so keep doing that. Um, but we have tried. And no, I'm not going to get Pete to fire me so that I can send you up to the US next week. More reflections? Yeah, I, I just I just want to second what you just said before there. Um, find the money to buy those tickets. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to happen. You you do need that face time, that's for sure. Uh, otherwise, emails. I mean, you receive a billion emails during a week. It doesn't matter, really. You need it. Yeah, I just wanted to throw out like kind of a contrarian thing that hasn't been stated today, and, and that's... Not necessarily something I expect to happen, but something I think we should we should all be cognizant of as a possibility, which is kind of this notion of careful what we wish for 
and if some trends all kind of coalesce and catch, it, it only takes a couple, you know, successful folks from Silicon Valley with a lot of money to change the dynamic of the investment ecosystem in a dramatic way because of how small it is. And to your point just now about, well, we tried it, it didn't work. And so now it, it's kind of this feeling of like, well, we tried it, it didn't work, and now it's dead. If, if investors come over and they write big checks and they get excited and those things don't pan out because the ecosystem's not ready for that much money at once, um, you know, in five years, 10 years time, it might be like, yeah, we had a fund and we invested big in New Zealand and it didn't work out. And so now we went to other international markets. And so I, I think we, we also need to actually plan for like radical success. Like what would another $150 million more than what's currently being invested in the Wellington ecosystem look like just as a scenario? Um, or how do we combat that from happening? Because once something catches, like the, the VC ecosystem can often herd into, into that area, just as a possibility. Josh. This is um, more of a question. I'm just curious about uh, who are the investors who inspire you and that you um, most respect and why? Told you he uh, asked good questions. It's a terrible thing to say. I, I, it's not a terrible thing to say. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to say Sam Morgan. Yeah. So um, I obviously don't know the American investors. I, I, you know, I read all the names. Um, I, 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 I don't know them. Um, Sam, I've, I've worked with for a very, very long time, and you know, Sam's been, <laughs> to use the, the the term here, incredibly impactful with what he's done. Um, subsequent to Trade Me, um, both in terms of investments and things like VN Zero. Um, so he's had incredible repetitive commercial success, which I'm envious of um, at, at one level. Um, um, but then he's also you know, given extremely generous of his, generously of his time and his money in terms of his philanthropic endeavour as well. So you know, for a guy who's a, you know, a good seven or eight years younger than me, he's kind of kind of leading the, leading the light, I think, to some extent in New Zealand. And it's, it's guys like Sam, and it, and it will be Rod when he sort of washes out of, of zero and has kind of done his time there, that those um, entrepreneurs that have played big and won big, um, when, they, when they come back into the community and start reinvesting back into the community, they, 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 they make a tremendous contribution. Yeah. So um, Sam Morgan is one data point. I think part of the problem is we don't have enough sterling exemplars of role models in New Zealand. So we're making it up as we go along. And um, we, I think it's incumbent on us to become those role models, each and every one of us. Um, you know, I follow uh, Brad Feld and Fred Wilson and Mark Andreessen. and you know, they're really interesting to read. But I think, you know, would, you know how, how would this play out in New Zealand? And you know, in the same way that I don't want to be the next Silicon Valley, I don't want it to be the next Brad Feld or the next Andreessen either. You know, I think we have to be what we are and, 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 and become what we want to become, and that's really important. What Dave said. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. Or reflection. Um, it's neither. It's a call to guerrilla activism around uh, flights and airfare costs. Um, so um, we came pretty close um, when we started Landing Pad to getting a pretty good deal out of Air New Zealand. And Rob Fife, the CEO, then was was very on board. Unfortunately, the Christchurch earthquake diverted twenty million dollars of their kind of support fund, quite rightly, to much closer to home. Um, so we've reinvigorated that conversation after a pretty significant restructure there, but a um, couple of points I think we could make um, significant progress out of just around this community. One is that um, the good news is that Air New Zealand is actively increasing the number of flights to San Francisco um, towards the end of this year. And of course that also means that commercially they need to find a hell of a lot more pipeline. But the focus for them when we ask the question, you know, can we do some deals on flights to there, is that they're predominantly focused currently in North America about building pipeline to come here. So of course this is a great opportunity today for, for a call to you all to say, remember to fill out those My Voice forms, um, remind them greatly of Hawaiian Airlines uh, and you know, some alternatives emerging and um, 
would be great support for our continued petition to them to have a think about giving us some relief for you know quite a growing and active um, customer community for them moving backwards and forwards to San Francisco particularly, but the US in general. Thanks for that, John. One last question. Last, last, last. Okay. Thank you. Um, maybe a reflection on the VC and the culture here. I, I think we've spent the past couple of days talking about how to make New Zealand uh, an incubator for a different kind of company and a different kind of vision and a strategy for holistic companies that take the greater good into thought and how we should be more in about uh, just a great exit. And I think oftentimes the aggressive strategy of any VC is to maximize profit and to have a great exit just straight ahead of the corner as fast as you can. Is that what you want to build here? Is that the kind of market we want to build up if you want to see New Zealand as, as a sort of a new element of, of, uh, of how business should be? I think it's, um, you know, clearly you want to um, invest in, in, in companies that are going to be long-term sustainable. And, um, and that long-term sustainability um, means that they've got to be respectful of a whole bunch of other things. What I have to say from uh, an investment point of view, I do it also to make money. And, um, and there's a bunch of angel investors in here, and, and our only ability, the only thing that gives us the privilege to keep doing that is when we get something back. And 90% uh, of what I do, I don't get anything back from. It's 90% for philanthropy. And um, so we, we do have to, for me, I mentally separate those, separate those two things. You know, I don't want to be investing in stuff and we've got ethic, ethical guidelines about what we'll invest in and what we won't invest in. So we're not going to invest in anything that's going to destroy the planet or exploit people or, or do these sorts of things. And... Um, um, so we want to make money over here, and then we want to spend it over here. And if you kind of look at most um, of the top philanthropists around the world, that's kind of how it's worked. You know, it's um, built built a great business, sold out of that business, and then they've got into charitable endeavour, and that's why we have the next foundation. Um, so I think there's there's always going to be a tension there, um, and um, it's more and more important that you know businesses um, have sustainable practices. Um, otherwise they're going to get beaten up by their consumers, by their customers. Um, but at the end of the day, we're still investing for profit. Um, and I'll take that profit and I'll do my philanthropic side with my other hand. Yeah. And the most successful business people I know are incredibly philanthropic. It's the same community. Yes, and uh, as well as that, you know, we, we are angel investors or early stage investors. But um, any of us can invest in businesses in any stage. In New Zealand, we don't have a large enough base of large companies. We've got a very, very small base. Our, our largest companies you know, are way down the Fortune 1000. You know, we don't have that base. We need more medium-sized enterprises as well. So. With the angel investing, it is usually planning for an exit. That is usually what's in mind, the exit's in mind. But there are lots of other business possibilities, opportunities, models that you, know, you can build a business and keep building. If the business is really good, why exit? Really, if you've got a business in hand, then you should not exit unless you have a better opportunity to spend the money on that you'll get as income from your business. But if you've got a business that knows how to grow and reinvest its capital successfully, then you would roll with it. It's not all a race for the door. So there are a couple of things I'd like to add to that. One is it's a, startups are like, uh, they're like people. They're like young people. Each one is different. Each one has a different uh, potential, uh, different skills, different capabilities. And so I think, what you're saying is right, but I think we need to be investing in a wide spectrum of things and see what works best and then pour petrol on the fire as it start and, 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 and really back up those investments with, with you know with more. So it's not a question of you know choosing one path or another path. You know, even though our resources are scarce, I I think we do have to try a number of things. 
But with respect to an incubation nation, um, I don't mean to be down, but I, I don't see it working very well for the following reason, that even though superficially New Zealand looks like a microcosm of the rest of the world, uh, in terms of the demographics, in terms of rapid technology uptake and so on, um, once you scratch beyond that surface, it's so tiny a country that the problems that you, that you learn about starting a business in New Zealand are not the real problems that you need to solve doing a, pro, uh, doing a business in the, in, in, in the bigger, wider world. Distribution, sales and marketing, these are the things that kill Kiwi businesses <clears throat> overseas because the scale here is so vastly different. So if you do want to use New Zealand as an incubation nation, it's great to make sure that you've got clear boundaries about what you mean by incubation and that the moment you validated the, the various incubatory ideas, the moment that beak starts coming out of the egg, that bird is flying offshore into a real market uh, where they're going to be facing real problems and learning how to solve the real issues that they're going to face, not the problems that we face here in New Zealand. Thank you very much for sharing all your perspectives and getting this conversation started. Really appreciate it, and I hope uh, we continue it uh, during the breaks that we have and the breakout session that we're going to have later on in the afternoon. But first, I just want to thank you all for, for your time. Thank you.